trying to position the microphone just right. No. I need a sound check. So, okay. So Kingston, Washington is good. And Heather is good. And Marie is good. Yeah, good. Okay, Connor says good. <clears throat> oh. uh, yeah, today um, uh, also is uh, Councillor Ramshay's birthday, so I'd like to recognize um, uh, his Dharma activities and. Um, uh, Rejoice in his precious human rebirth. So, <clears throat> for uh, those uh, serious Dharma practitioners, we uh, uh, have a practice called Four Contemplations that Turn the Mind to Dharma. And uh, the first one is precious human rebirth, which doesn't mean that um, it's just, just good to be human being. It also means that we have we recognize that we have everything we need to practice the Dharma. Um, and that includes, we have the opportunity to hear uh, authentic teachings and compassionate teachings. So uh, when uh, we're celebrating uh, Ramshay's birthday, um, uh, I, I would say we should also be celebrating our precious human rebirth, you know, recognizing the opportunities we have and um, to make those opportunities come to fruition. So uh, I'm not uh, uh, sure, but I think we should um, uh, light, light a couple of uh, like uh, the golden candles. Um, so, and then uh, one for Lama one for Buddha, and then Dharma and Sangha. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and our conventional L room shades a 40 something. So <laughs> that's a wonderful age. That. <clears throat> so uh, before singing happy birthday, I just like to um, do the uh, song from the Lama Chopa that we sing before Darshan each time. So this is tantric style. So, you know, we're putting the Lama uh, uh, Guru, you know, at the top of our heads and with great devotion. So uh, uh, I already feel uh, just in the short contact I've had with her, she had great devotion and uh, I extend that to all of you. So uh, hopefully, Ramshe and uh, is listening in Nepal. Uh, and uh, so let's just sing together like this. Namo Gurude, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Gurude, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya. Namo Sangaya, Namo Gurube, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Just one more time. Namo Gurube, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Now, now we're warmed up. So now we can sing <laughs> the uh, American uh, birthday uh, Dharani. All right, you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rinpoche. Happy birthday to you. Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> yeah, so that's good. Uh, and we we have some cupcakes, uh, which uh, now with your blessing after the service, we'll consume in your honor. How's that? So um, I'd also like to do uh, lead a short uh, recitation and visualization for Medicine Buddha and uh, dedicate this to Rinpoche's activities uh, in Nepal and India. We, we all know what the news is um, and it's important to do our Medicine Buddha practice. That's a big part of our temple practice and particularly dedicate this for uh, Rinpoche's health and Dharma activities and uh, for uh, the youngsters that he so lovingly cares for. <clears throat> So uh, if Ramshay has to say goodbye um, and uh, do the many activities of an abbot, I totally understand. Um, and uh, please come uh, to the West in health uh, when you can come. And uh, I'll appreciate that visit. So uh, Medicine Buddha, <clears throat> we should know, have memorized, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> so we can read out together, okay. Above the crown of your head, upon a lotus and moon disc, is the medicine Buddha. His body is blue in color, and blue light radiates from him in all directions. His right hand, in the gesture of granting sublime realizations, rests on his right knee and holds the stem of an aurora plant between his thumb and index finger. His left hand in the gesture of concentration holds a lapis lazuli bowl filled with medicinal nectar. He is seated in the Vajra posture wearing the three saffron robes of a monk and has the signs and marks of a Buddha. I take refuge and tell him enlightened the Buddhas, the Dharma and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by practicing giving and the other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. Reverently, I prostrate my body, speech, and mind to do Guru Medicine Buddha and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtues of all ordinary and noble beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends of Dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate all the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. Now request. I request you, Bhagwan, master of healing, whose sky-colored body of lapis lazuli signifies omniscient wisdom and compassion as vast as limitless space. Please inspire my mind. I request you, compassionate master of healing, who holds in your right hand the king of medicines, symbolizing your vow to help all sentient beings plagued by the 424 diseases. Please inspire my mind. I request you, compassionate master of healing, who holds in your left hand a bowl of nectar, symbolizing your vow to give the glorious undying nectar of Dharma to eliminate the degenerations of sickness, fear, stress, depression, grief, old age, and death. Please inspire my mind. I prostrate, go for refuge, and make offerings to the fully realized destroyer of all defilements, completely perfected enlightened being who has realized the ultimate nature of all phenomena, Medicine Buddha, King of Lapis Light, may your vow to benefit all sentient beings now ripen for myself and others. So uh, for ourselves, we have to establish ourselves as Medicine Buddha. We'll do the mantra and then we'll send out for healing for others, okay? So here's the visualization. So in response to your request, infinite blue rays of light stream down from the heart and body of King of Medicine. The light completely fills your body from head to toe, purifying all diseases. If you have any pain or any specific illnesses, focus the blue light directly on the spot and visualize the light burning away the disease. All ailments due to interfering forces and the negative karma and mental obscurations that cause these, as well as anxiety, fear, and negative emotion are also purified. These leave you in the form of dirty liquid, which then completely disappears. Your body becomes the nature of light, clean and clear like a crystal. Light from Medicine Buddha again fills your body, bringing with it the realizations of the past and all the good qualities of the Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. Your mind is transformed into love, compassion, and wisdom. 
while doing the visualization, send on your site the mantra. So everyone should know, I'll just repeat slowly. Tayata Om Bekanze Bekanze Maha Bekanze Baza Samagate Sala. So we'll do uh, at least 100, 100 names, okay? Oh, man. Very good. After reciting the mantra, the medicine Buddha melts in delight and absorbs into your heart. Your mind becomes non dual with the Buddha's Dharma Kaya mind. Then healing for others is really important. Visualize the medicine Buddha on the crown of each living being's head. You may think specifically of those who are suffering and in need of healing. Do the visualization with the light first purifying the, their diseases and their causes, then bringing them the realization of the path to enlightenment. And then we'll do just, we don't have a lot of time. I don't want to keep room share. So 21, all right? I have to, oh my God. Imagine the medicine Buddha on the crown of each sentient being's head, melting in delight, being absorbed into their hearts, bringing infinite peace, compassion, and wisdom. May the supreme bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. Through this virtuous action, may I quickly attain the state of a medicine Buddha and lead every being without exception into the pure world. Just like the Guru Medicine Buddha who guides all sentient beings with compassion as infinite as space, may I also become a compassionate guide of sentient beings who exist in all directions of the universe. Oh, so I'm particularly grateful for Rimshade to give regular teachings uh, with all the many uh, duties uh, and activities he has for our Alliance or Sangha. It's been an infinite blessing. So um, please make uh, the time to listen to the teachings live or uh, recorded. I don't know if uh, Rimshi is still on. 
but if if you would like to say hello, that's fine. <laughs> Omahan, if you'd like to say hello, we'd love to hear you say hi. Maybe, he, I don't know if he can hear or not. So. Yes, yes, now I can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so Very nice birthday. to see you. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wow. Just uh, right now in the Nepal is uh, 11.58. And uh, you wow. all <laughs> were right time. After two minutes, it will be me third. So <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> we got in under the wire. Yeah. <laughs> right time. Perfect time. Thank you so much. Lamala, and uh, thank you so much for all the Sangha members. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, wishing me on my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Wonderful dreams. Thank you, Rinpoche. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then maybe I might take a leave. No. <laughs> All right, that's fine. <laughs> now it's, uh, now it's uh, maybe after one yeah. minute, it will turn into the main three <laughs> in yeah. Nepal time. So it will be that's 12 right. a.m. So. <laughs> yeah, leave. Thank you. All right, ciao. Yeah. So, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Lamala. Really, I really, yeah. really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. And I hope to see you, Lamala, soon. And uh, all the yeah. Sangha members yeah. soon. Thank you. Thank you, and yeah. have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, that was just right too. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see. We can still hear each other okay? Yeah. So uh, uh, we're going through still the um, 12 links of dependent origination. Uh, this one's called the uh, six ayatanas, um, the six uh, sense bases. Um, or the six uh, internal sense fields sometimes that uh, are the basis for consciousness like that. Fast, but I think it's really important. <clears throat> So for there to be a full experience, we need uh, a sense object and we need a sense space and we need the consciousness. We need to be paying attention. So uh, if, if we uh, said the object was, uh, you know, our uh, broccoli for dinner, so that's the object. And then we have, uh, uh, consciousness, we have to be paying attention to eating and what it would taste like. And of course, we need the tongue. Um, but we also need the sense base because um, someone could be having, they could have the broccoli, they could be paying attention, uh, and they have a tongue, but uh, they're not tasting anything. So some people, for example, that uh, have had COVID or COVID symptoms report, they don't taste anything, is that right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of interesting. This is different than consciousness. Consciousness means we're paying attention. Uh, we're having lots of experiences all the time, uh, but we're not paying attention. We could say we're kind of hearing, you know, someone's talking to us or some sound is going on and they say, aren't you paying attention? And we go, oh yeah. So. Uh, this isn't about paying attention, it's um, uh, the capacity to have the consciousness make a difference. So uh, I think, and you know, of course, ancient India, uh, they didn't have the neurological uh, uh, acumen. They, they, we weren't talking about the brain and parts of the brain. 
Um, but uh, I'd like to take a little leap that that's kind of what we're talking about because the commentaries on the ayatanas I mean, it's a subtle form of matter that uh, the consciousness is able to uh, activate and be, uh, be supported by. So uh, I'm guessing this subtle form of matter, they would, you know, at some point, you know, we think that would be in the tongue, but we know, we know now that probably it's the brain, right? So we, we need that aspect of the brain uh, to register um, the taste because we can't have the broccoli, we can't be paying attention, um, we can't have a tongue, but uh, not taste anything because something uh, not uh, subtle matter, uh, I'd like to think maybe it's here and not necessarily here, uh, is the sense base is not operating like that. <clears throat> so uh, we actually, uh, we actually need the brain, you know? <laughs> so uh, when we're talking about mind uh, on a deep level, uh, and particularly in Vajrayana Tantra, Mahamudra Zogchen, we're talking about the mind being here, right? The heart mind. <clears throat> but it's okay to talk about the, um, these relative states of consciousness, because that's what the 12 links are. Uh, uh, talking about brain consciousness. So um, the Dalai Lama, for example, has had several uh, conversations, many conversations with scientists, uh, neurologists, physicists, but a lot of neurologists around uh, what these different kinds of bases are. Um, some people may be aware of that uh, uh, Mind and Life conference conferences which started in Boulder have uh, been something ongoing, lots of times in different locations like Dharamsala or the Dalai Lama, you know, talking about these different levels of mind and to what degree do you need uh, the brain of this kind of basis, right? So uh, I find those discussions interesting. Uh, luckily, when I was uh, in Boulder at Norfolk University, I was able to uh, meet uh, Dr. Varela um, who started the mind and life con you know, consciousness. And um, I like those kind of discussions. So uh, these discussions, how mind and body work together, how kind of a Abhidharma feel about them. So uh, uh, just a little sneak preview as uh, Elizabeth um, Zim and I are, are putting together a presentation on Abhidharma. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, she's doing all the technical work <laughs> like that, uh, putting the slides together. I'm looking forward to working with her. So how do we practice um, from, a, a, you know, is this just information like we need to have a healthy brain, have a healthy nervous system in order to have a full experience? Um, yes, we do. So. Uh, Please try to avoid brain injuries, but uh, also uh, we can practice from uh, this uh, basis from uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen approach like this. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to elevate this a little bit. My, is this. <clears throat> so some people may be aware that I, I do this meditation. <clears throat> So uh, here we're, we're listening to the sound. I don't know, maybe this will blow away, so I'll put it back. So we're listening to the sound um, and we're registering, oh, okay, that's, we have the bell, we have the sound, we're paying attention and we have the sense base to do it. But um, we're gonna keep listening even when uh, the physical sound stops, right? Some of you have done this meditation with. It's like Mahamudra uh, where you, you keep looking um, through the sky without stopping, right? You look up at the sky and you don't, you don't stop. Uh, we, we say we keep knowing even when there's no object. When we realize the mind uh, 
is pure knowing and doesn't have uh, object, uh, then we've attained some insight, correct? But we can do that with uh, the other uh, senses too. So let me see if you, you can hear the gong just to hear. Is that too much? Just right, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try this a little bit. <laughs> this is an experiment. We do it online here. Okay, so we're 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 hearing the sound, and then but keep listening as if the sound is still there. So listen with like of course your your inner ear, your sense base. All right. La la la. <laughs> uh, we can do that with any of the senses, you know. We keep tasting. We say aftertaste, so maybe, maybe with some uh, foodies, that's the way to go, right? If you're a foodie, but maybe you don't like broccoli. So, uh, Lama Yeshi used to talk about chocolate. <laughs> so uh, when we're doing uh, shamatha also, uh, which I like to stress, um, shamatha is really uh, uh, technically uh, shutting down all the outer senses, right? So when we're doing shamatha, we're really going inside. Um, so we're not really working with outer objects and outer senses. So when we, uh, you know, aren't so, getting so much energy to that outer senses, uh, then, uh, and we're looking more like the visualization part, uh, then, uh, not only are we keeping those 10 spaces very healthy, but uh, we're developing uh, strong health and also sometimes uh, cities or powers, you see. So uh, we need that style of shamatha. Shamatha uh, in our tradition generally, of course, will start by seeing outer objects like flower or sometimes rock. No, but basically like a, a Buddha and then 
developing a strong visualization, um, or it could start with breath. But uh, then it's really very internal, isn't it? So um, in America, uh, is a highly external consumer environment. So of course the mindfulness movement is geared towards, this will make you more functional in daily life. Um, <laughs> but uh, our shamatha is not designed to make you more functional in daily life. Uh, so uh, it, it does require time and um, some kind of uh, quiet and uh, isolation almost. Uh, so that's why I'm glad, uh, you know, Karen is uh, very wonderfully putting together um, uh, turning the yoga studio into a, a retreat cabin. You know, that's fantastic. <clears throat> uh, ability to turn inward um, sometimes seems as like uh, self-serving or people uh, don't want to do it. Um, but we have to get down on this very uh, deep internal level of awareness in order to um, have that uh, strength to then do uh, not only the DD yoga practices, but the um, Bhati teachings and the Mahamudra teachings like that. So I find that if people are skipping that, if uh, they're skipping um, the shamatha, and if they're skipping the maha yoga uh, practices and they just say, oh, I'm just just doing uh, Sokchan, then uh, sometimes it, it feels kind of, uh, you know, thin, right? <laughs> it's kind of like someone's giving you uh, the, you know, it's, it's it's coffee that's too thin or something, or a soup that's too thin. I mean, it's there, but uh, it doesn't have the richness. So um, the shamatha practice is not just concentration practice, but really doing uh, internal work that deepens uh, our holding capacity. Um, in Christian tradition, Christian psychotherapy, Jungian world, like Thomas More's, Written, uh, an ex priest written a lot on you know, the soul, and James Hillman, the post Jungian, written a lot about the soul, right? So, this kind of world of um, deep uh, inner world that can be shared with others is cultivated through these internal practices. <clears throat> and uh, they um, they, they do help you perhaps to drive better or be a better business person, <laughs> um, but uh, it's more designed to be like a, uh, to be very deep and to have many inner resources like that and have a very rich um, you know, uh, inner mulch, maybe something like that. So the shamatha practices uh, from the complete path are not, um, dry technical practice, but, um, you know, doing, uh, if I could say, doing that kind of soul work that uh, can lead to a lot of healing too, right? Not just healing of mental, but healing of body. So when people want to do uh, a lot of medicine Buddha practice, you also have to do, uh, go deep within and do deep shamatha practice. Of course, if we don't have trainings, then when we do the deep work, um, it's going to bring up all kinds of, uh, you know, not just agitation or not just dullness, but all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, inner conflicts and shadow material, right? Haven't we all found that? <clears throat> like that. So generally in the uh, shamatha manuals, um, you know, we're, those aren't, being taught because they're just, you never teach shamatha alone, right? So it's it's always part of the whole deal. So um, when we're teaching from that technical manual point of view, it's it's just teaching you how to like uh, ride the horse, right? How to sit properly, 
on how to, you know, maybe put the saddle on and put the bid on and here's the technique. It doesn't really tell you all the stuff that you, you get into with horses and pets or anything, right? It doesn't tell you about all the, all the stuff, all the uh, drama and all the journey stuff. It just says, okay, here's, you want to ride. This is, this is how you sit in the English saddle. This is how you sit in Western. This is how you get on the horse, right? You know, like that, because we, we've talking about the journey and we've talking about what you do when the horse runs away with you <laughs> or what you do. Like this happened to me a lot in Colorado, be riding along. And I was not a good rider, so horses would always screw with me. Like they they come to a river a creek and they just put their head down to drink and you just go flying. So did that happen to anybody? <laughs> so uh, this that's not covered in the technical piece of how to actually, you know, kind of ride correctly. That's part of the journey. So that's why we have uh, all the other teachings and trainings to talk about the journey. But the uh, quiet, internalized um, meditations are just as important as the more external meditations like that. And I'm sure everyone knows who's you know, developed that. So <clears throat> the, uh, the ayatanas um, are most important. Um, and uh, from the higher levels, these, these aren't just uh, brain ayatanas, it's developing the um, capacity uh, to do the practice, you know, it's uh, building up uh, the ground level, so to speak, like that. So um, maybe we can uh, take a few minutes for um, people's uh, input or questions or uh, confusions, happy to listen. <clears throat> Oh, just ask me, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, not so long ago, you, you said that you, know, you need the shadows. I wonder if you could you know, say more about them. So when I say shadow, like um, Patty was asking about shadow, uh, I know I'm using kind of a, a Jungian point, <laughs> like psychoanalytic term. So, uh, if there's light, like a beam of light, um, it also means there's going to be something in, uh, that's dark, right? And it means that if we're looking at something in a directional way, it means we're not gonna see what's behind us. So generally we would say shadow is, is what is uh, the reverse of the light. It doesn't mean shadow is bad, it just means what we're not paying attention to. But usually we get stuck in patterns where we're not paying attention to uh, large uh, parts of ourselves. And mostly people are not paying attention to their inner world or their real inner world. I would say they're paying attention to their, the surface world of thoughts and kind of emotions or are pissed off or we're happy or we've got to do that task or we've got to do this task. That's still not really inner world. It's, very surface, you know, it's the surface of the water world. So when I'm talking about shamatha in the shadow, it means, uh, you know, going, uh, taking a deep dive and uh, seeing what's down there. Because we're usually not paying attention to that, you're usually just sailing on the surface, right? So shadow doesn't have to be negative, they're jewels in the ocean too, but they're also sharks. <laughs> like that. So it's possible to think, oh, we're doing really good practice if we just stay in our sailboat and the um, water is calm, right? So that's superficial sam uh, shamatha, superficial samadhi, or superficial tranquility, just when there's a momentary uh, no thought, uh, and clarity and bliss, right? We have those experiences, but unless we do the deep practice, those are uh, temporary states. 
So to do the deep practice, we, we have to do uh, the inner yogas uh, and start the exploration process. Loma, Karen has a question. Oh, good. I don't know how to put my hand down now, but um, <laughs> anyway. You got it. <laughs> um, I wondered what you, when you said the deep inner world can be shared with others, are you talking about both sort of conventionally and also um, at a, that at our most subtle, deep, subtle levels that we are, that is where we're connect, interconnected? Yeah, we can share on a deep, subtle level too. So um, that, that's what's kind of interesting. Uh, of course, I'm talking to all practitioners here. So um, you won't just 5150 me, you know, but it's possible to, you know, of course, um, people that practice closely together can have similar dreams or visit each other or know what's happening with other people, right? Of course, there are lots of reports you know, when people are become aware of when people are ill or have accidents or uh, death or something, but uh, it doesn't all have to be negative. So it defies the usual science and psychology because, you know, we're, you're not um, in the presence of someone and yet you're um, able to, uh, you know, have some sense of the same experience. And, and does, Developing, I mean, I consider, I don't know if this is correct. I consider that kind of a city um, to have that kind of awareness of other beings. Um, is that something that we develop by going to these deeper levels in meditation more often? Yeah, so traditionally that, that comes about with shamatha practice, you see, because yes. uh, we're withdrawing, so to speak, from the outer senses and you know, we're, we're, we're taking the dive. The thing is usually these qualities that everyone has are not developed. Um, and so they might not even be aware of them or they might be just um, certain, you know, intense moments. Um, but there's also a problem, of course, when we do, you know, kind of an unsupervised dive, you know, and, and <laughs> then people uh, do, you know, get in trouble, they get, <laughs> you know, overwhelmed by what we call primary process and, you know, uh, and that, yeah. that's a real thing. So um, you, you always want the llama to check your tanks <laughs> and your <laughs> system before you go down, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We have a bit of a discussion uh, about the word ayatana, um, specifically because there is some information on uh, Rigpa Wiki, as far as I know, that it, it actually translates between the 12 ayatanas, meaning the, the inner and outer forms, um, not just the fourth link of the 12 links of dependent origin, uh, of dependent links of origination. Um, could you say a little bit about that and maybe clarify that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we're talking about the 12 links, it's generally kept to these six um, because um, the 12 links uh, are trying to describe uh, how samsara comes about in kind of a developmental way. So uh, these sense bases are, it'd be a little bit more like uh, a child before being born in the womb is they're, they're, they're developing, but they're not fully there. And then when we're talking from a fully developed adult and, you know, kind of born, then uh, you'd have all 12. Thank you, Lama. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a really important kind of uh, practice thing, um, but in the, 12 links, um, how it's ended up practically in the tradition is, is like, 
getting people to really see uh, that samsara is, is constantly going through birth and death and that until we become uh, Buddha that we're not going to be free, you know. So it wants to describe uh, the process so that we really go, oh, this is, if I just stay in ordinary consciousness, this is what's going to happen. So um, the idea is things are kept to kind of, uh, you know, generally a minimum like that. Um, maybe, maybe during the Buddhist time, uh, you know, he spent more time talking about it than they do in the tradition lots of times. So there are, there are a number of sutras that I've asked people if you really want to get into it, where the Buddha would go into more detail about uh, the developmental process like that. <clears throat> but the idea is to um, point out how uh, this process happens kind of unconsciously and automatically and for us to kind of go, whoa, I don't want to be, I don't want to be just continually reborn and going through the same suffering again and again. <clears throat> So it's like that, or minimal. When things are broken down into cause and effect, um, which the Buddha did a lot, the point was to show that they can't be um, independently existing. So sometimes we really have to break things down a lot to show people that, no, actually this is just a cause and effect sequence and to convince you we're willing to go into read detail so some teachers go into you know deep detail about um, these different states and how these evolve and uh, that definitely is a piece of abhidharma like that for most people they don't want to know they just want to go okay you know i just want to know the basics i got it i got it you know, you don't have to convince me anymore. I don't have to know um, how the whole thing works. So I like to know how the whole mind and body works. And I don't really like to know um, like how, you know, my mobile phone or computer works until I can't get it to work. And then it's annoying. <laughs> so <laughs> I should probably know more like that. <clears throat> But generally, the 12 links, when uh, lamas are teaching them, they're, they're meant to uh, help people develop the four contemplations, you know, precious human rebirth, impermanence, karma cause and effect, and uh, defects of samsara, like that. So they're usually taught quick, uh, right up front with um, things. But um, there's another tradition uh, and I think uh, Kenshin Rimshay last month or a couple of months ago uh, said if we go into the 12 links in a deep way, then it's taught a lot later in the curriculum. Lama, may I ask um, a question? Yeah, hi. Hi, that was really helpful. And I think um, I, I got kind of interested in this Ayana word. I, I I'm not even saying it right. Ayatana. 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 So it's not like yeah. It's not like it's not like Italian. <laughs> Sanskrit is like ayatana. Yeah, like ayatana. Um, but I appreciated what you just said, and I think for me, I it sort of helped me identify a source of confusion or not confusion necessarily, but. I always thought of the 12 links as you just described it, just kind of demonstrating the samsaric quality of human existence. But the way you're teaching it, there's actually content to each link that is valuable in and of itself. And I think I've had a little trouble reconciling those two and, and knowing what sense to make of each consciousness or whatnot in and of itself. So, it's it's different, a little different the way you're teaching it. There's more, a lot more content to each link rather than just the message of all the links together being circular and continual samsara. Yeah, good. I'm, that's right. 
So, um, you know, so since we have to be both yogis and scholars, or at least informed uh, yogis, uh, scholarly bent yogis, uh, we, we need to, uh, as yogis, look deeply into this material and see how it applies to our yogic training. But lots of times uh, people need to get the information first and that's kind of a long run style, All right? So let's say someone's, um, you know, a drug addict, uh, we might, and we're trying to be helpful. Sometimes we just give information. Like, did you know that if you keep doing meth, your teeth are gonna fall out, you know? Uh, and that information might be enough like, oh, I love my teeth. They're not gonna, I don't want them to fall out. I'm gonna stop right there. Um, but we may also have to get people to contemplate, uh, and in most cases we do contemplate the negative uh, factors in their lives. That and so from a much bigger perspective. So we can't just generally just say, you know, this kind of drug's not good for you. So usually we have to get people into the experience of it's really not fun and have the experiential knowledge, not just the information. So I always try to cover both. And, um, you know, we're doing the practice and training from uh, a yogi point of view. So when people are listening to these Dharma talks, if you're not doing any training in meditation, uh, I don't know if they'll make that much sense. Hopefully a little bit, right? But the assumption is actually people are doing uh, enough training and enough reading so it doesn't have to be spoon fed yeah so thank you for noticing that <laughs> well and if I can just follow up um, is it is it one of these areas of teachings where it can be taught at many different levels and us students we hear it at different levels depending on what we need and where we are and our disposition and so forth <clears throat> yeah definitely so okay. um you know, sometimes that's that's why uh, it it it's it's more what the uh, student brings, so to speak, the readiness, right? So um, that's why I think it's in words of my perfect teacher. You know, Patron Shay's book. It could be somewhere else, but um, I mentioned before where uh, you know he's just lying on the ground in the middle of the night with his teacher, Do Kensei, and Do Kensei said, do, do you see, do you hear the dogs barking? And Patra says, yes, and Kensei says, that's it, you see. But because uh, the student was completely right, you know, that at very simple teachings. So uh, generally, um, the, the, it, it's kind of starts, the teachings start out kind of literal and simple, and then they get real complex, you know, and then they come back to being really simple. But by then you've taken the journey, right? And um, you see Kansas with different eyes. <laughs> yeah, so things are always on, on different levels, but it's more accurate maybe to say, you know, we're at different places in our journey. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Ah, well, uh, well, we're, this is um, this is our Zoom program, right? We're on Zoom. Um, does it does it work for everybody? Okay, all right, good. <clears throat> so that's why you know generally, um, you know, skipping practices, uh, you know, means skipping developmental steps. So, you know, some of us as kids might have skipped developmental steps. Um, but then it means you have to go back and get them anyway. So it's, you know, 
uh, you have to run back down the mountain and um, touch that boulder and then come back up again. So it looks like we're going faster if we're skipping steps, but actually then we'll end up going slower. <clears throat> Oh, the lighting, the lighting is really good with the zoom and I appreciate, you know, that, but I hope the sound is also okay. Sound is better, same. Okay. <clears throat> so those people that had the chance to come up uh, and do the Mahamudra retreat, um, <clears throat> I ask you to keep reflecting upon, uh, you know, third Karmapa's Mahamudra aspiration prayer. Um, it uh, has different translations. The one I'm familiar with is from the Nalanda translation, so Trungpa Shay's group. But there are other uh, uh, good translations from Lord Zawa House that you might like also. So with Mahamudra and Dzogchen pieces, just read, you know, a couple of verses and then uh, then do your meditation, or um, shall I say, as Namkai uh, Norbu Rimshe would say, your contemplation. So Namkai uh, <clears throat> Norbu Rimshe was a really interesting uh, teacher who spent many years in Italy um, and also studied uh, in Dzogchen teachings and also was very close to Bon teachings too. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he stressed, just, just read it and don't, don't be, um, Pandita style. Then don't try to go, what does that mean? And what does that mean? Don't do that. Just like poetry, right? So that's why poetry and, uh, pith instructions, higher teachings are not meant to be analyzed always in the same way that the sutras and shastras, which are using uh, intellect. So uh, you just want to read it and uh, then let it let it uh, hit you experientially. You don't have to be, oh, what is what is, what does the third ka mapa mean by you can't say it's this, you can't say it isn't this. Now, what does that mean? Let's see. You know, no, just uh, just hear the words, but let the meaning uh, sink in. Uh, you know, without uh, a pandita's hat, right? <laughs> At this point, you know, we're not we're not there to try to analyze uh, in that way. So that's how you know we're, we approach teachings differently too. So you could even approach the uh, twelve links uh, by just meditating on you know just on birth, for example, and meditating just on. Uh, you know, clinging or grasping like that. So we have a Dzogchen way of, uh, Mahamudra way of looking directly at these uh, states of mind, right? <clears throat> but it's not the it's not the analysis uh, the same as in the same way as we're doing with, um, you know, the sutras and shastras. Both are important. So we say we need both left and right side of the brain. Yeah. Okay, um, hi. Hi, Lomana. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing, uh, since uh, Ellen's question and your response, and of course I have the Dohas on my mind because I talked about them last week, so I spent a few weeks right. looking at them more carefully than I usually have. Yeah. And uh, your, your, the Patro Rinpoche story with, with Doge Kense, it's, it seems like it's a Mahamudra instruction. It seems like those, or, or Dzogchen, in that case was Dzogchen, but uh, 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 that, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, although they're spontaneous songs, they're not just spontaneous songs to the universe. They're, they're instru fifth instructions to a specific student at a specific time. And yes. if you, if I, if I, if I allow myself to open up then that instruction, might coincide with my time 
in the way it did right. with the original student, which somehow, sometimes it seems like that docente instruction almost does it for me sometimes. Yes, you know, that's a wonderful thing. It's both very particular, but uh, universal. So we, we do know what it's like. And, uh, you know, uh, we can receive instruction that way too, and realization that way too. Um, but I appreciate you saying it, you know, we should think of the songs not as, um, you know, someone just kind of sound of music, walking around the mountains singing, you know, um, but uh, when um, we're in a very receptive state of mind, then, uh, you know, when um, our teacher gives a pith instruction, it, it feels like a song or a poem like that. So, uh, you know, uh, even when our teacher is being so-called fierce, uh, you know, we, we're, we're gonna hear it like, I so fucking love you, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. It's so intense, you know. So, so, you know, instead of like, I'm mad at you, you just like, wow, I, I didn't know you really loved me, you know? Like, you know, it's been so nice, but I thought you were just being nice, you know? So uh, the Dohas, um, have to have that kind of uh, riveting quality to them, as as you so aptly said, like last Sunday. Um, Ellen Ginsberg was like that, you know, like uh, would just kind of uh, <laughs> an Ellen Ginsberg way would just lock into you and say something from Blake, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> um, like it was kind of like I don't know, you know. At first, I couldn't like. This isn't for real, you know, but uh, <laughs> then it is, you know. So then those kind of uh, words uh, stay with you, right? So they do really become a song like that or a poem like that. Uh, so uh, you're absolutely right, you know, that, uh, but then the tradition is then we share those. Uh, they don't always have to be private and then others you know, um, can benefit. So uh, the dependent origination mantra, you know, that we do, Om Hetu, you know, blah, 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 um, comes from Shariputra asking so, uh, a monk coming from the lecture, like, oh, what did the Buddha say? And he just, well, you know, he taught all things from causes, you know, all things arise from causes. And uh, this is what the great Shramanera said, and Shariputra had a realization, right? So it's kind of that lineage like that. So that, um, uh, you know, a lot of the discussions uh, are, are poetic. Well, that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is, it is uh, funny um, and, I've hung out with a lot of poets like that. So um, I used to do that. And then, then I feel like just talking prose all the time to make up for it. <laughs> I don't know, I'm saying, uh, yeah, because poets sometimes are always um, talking, not always, I, you know, maybe just in fairly intense language and very used to languages. Uh, being very intense and presentational instead of informational, right? So uh, that's uh, Dzogchen particularly is um, very presentational. Uh, for me, it's, you know, this kind of just arbitrary distinction perhaps, but Mahamud is a little bit on the, like, a little bit the knowing side and Zogchen's knowing, but also it's the show me side, the spontaneous presentation side. So um, uh, Zogchen teachers are uh, uh, sometimes more likely to, you know, grab you like almost like Zen, same as Zen, you know, just grab you and say, well, what are you actually trying to say? You know, like that. So I've had that experience. <laughs> you can't put your hands on people in the West though. It's, it's a bummer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
especially in the last few years. Yeah, I get it. No, I get it. You know, but uh, it's it's much more physical in Asia, actually. <clears throat> So uh, we can close up, you know, if if and do prayers is fine. So people can have a lunch. Um, unless there are any last questions or comments, you know, thank you for everyone for being here. For um, you know, from uh, Las Vegas, actually it's Henderson, right, Marie? I like saying Las Vegas, but you know, so Vegas, okay. Yeah, the Vegas crowd. And Vegas sounds more edgy. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Vegas, I yeah, so like that. And then uh, today, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, Michelle and, and Michael visiting from San Pancho, right? So there you are, um, been very adventurous and uh, uh, holding group uh, practice there and um, carrying on with and learning from obstacles and transforming obstacles into uh, opportunities like true tantricas, right? So uh, I said, well, let's just call the group there uh, Pema Santin Ling. You know, so uh, Pema, as you know, Lotus Santin means uh, jhana or meditation Ling place. So I, I think that's. Uh, going to do quite well in San Pancho because it has a nice blend of steady people and uh, turistas, right? Coming and going, yeah? All right, so congratulations to them. Everybody that uh, is far and wide, you know, if you're just practicing even by yourself, uh, they're all sentient beings with you. So actually uh, you, you have a group, whether you know it or not. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I encourage everyone to invite people to practice together with you, whether you're in Pennsylvania, of course, or uh, Washington, uh, and, you know, Texas, and Nevada. Where else? Yeah. Cleveland, yeah. So especially Cleveland. I've been to Cleveland. I've been to Cleveland, so I like Cleveland. All right, so uh, let's end. Uh, let's end with prayers. Bye, Seattle. Bye, Squim. That's good. I'm just going to do the prayers myself. So, due to the merits of these virtuous actions. May we quickly attain a state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Bodhicitta that has not yet risen arise and grow. May that which has not arisen arise. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chen Rezin, Tenzin Jiaozu. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrants achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losong, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver, a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Aurul Kereshvara. Great treasure of optimist compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land's ages, Losandrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the day. Happy May. La la la. Thank you, Lama La. Thank you, Lama. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Lama. Lama. Yeah, good work. Good work, Hi. techies. Thank you, technical people. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Jackie. You, Thank you, Susan. Morris owes us a poem. Yeah. <laughs> Have a happy May. Yeah.